Hey everyone, I'm Megan Kelly. Welcome to The Megan Kelly Show and happy Friday. The coronation of King Charles begins this weekend, happens tomorrow, and we have a fantastic lineup of guests to help break down how Meghan Markle plans on stealing the show. <laughs> but first, we begin with news stateside, including the fallout following the death of a homeless man on a New York City subway this week. The left is losing its mind over this, trying to make this guy into the next George Floyd. Good luck, good luck. Neely was reportedly living on the streets of New York City and had been for many years. And on Monday, went on a subway car, the downtown L train, and began yelling and threatening passengers. Uh, he was restrained in a chokehold. No, today was the, or this, this time was the F train. He'd caused trouble before on the L train. He's been on all of them. He was restrained in a chokehold by a Marine veteran and fell unconscious. EMS workers at the station were unable to revive him and he has died. Now the left, including AOC, uh, is calling this a murder, a lynching, and demanding for the Marine to be charged accordingly. As of now, Manhattan prosecutors are continuing to conduct an investigation into the death, which has been ruled a homicide, but that doesn't attribute any intention to it. It's, it's uh, a death that's been caused by another, and there's a big push by those who have a bloodthirst for any one who intervenes to stop this kind of behavior from happening, to see this Marine charged with a crime that would put him in jail for the rest of his life. Joining me today, very happy to see Mark Stein is here, host of The Mark Stein Show and author of the new fiction book, The Prisoner of Windsor. Hey, subscribe to the show on YouTube and follow me on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Sure, you could go to Brazil or Colombia and get some crazy stuff done to your face, but why on earth would you do that? Now you can look years younger right before your eyes during the Genucel Mother's Day sale. Here's a real review from Genucel.com. Claire writes, I absolutely love Genucel. My skin feels so good, tighter, younger, and with a more even tone, and I only used it for a week. My advice for everyone, take a before picture. Her husband Jim writes in saying, wife loves it. Ever since I purchased it for her, things got much more interesting after dark. Enough said. Well, the thing is, Jim, if you look good and you feel good, then, you know, it leads to more goodness. That's just the truth for all of us. Nothing works like Genucel because it's a family recipe for over 20 years made by a compounding pharmacist in small batches and always safe, cruelty-free, and natural. Now go to genucel.com slash mk60 and save over 70% off Genucel's most popular package. That's all their best stuff during their Mother's Day sale. Every most popular package features their ultra retinol and dark spot corrector. Don't wait. Go now. It's genucel.com slash mk60. You get a complimentary spa essentials box with every package order from now through Mother's Day, plus free upgrade to priority shipping. G-E-N-U-C-E-L dot com slash MK60. Genucel dot com slash MK60. Mark, great to have you. Hey, it's always good to good good to see you, uh, Megan. Likewise. So this let's start with this this case because the left really is trying to make this guy into the next George Floyd. Um he's black, the, the man who died, the homeless man, the Marine veteran is white. And that was all they needed to pounce. Um, AOC, she calls this a public execution. She calls this a murder. I'll just read you in part what she says. Jordan Neely, that's the name of the, the mm. decedent, was murdered. But because Jordan was houseless and crying for food in a time when the city is raising rents and stripping services to militarize itself, while many in power demonize the poor, the murderer gets protected with passive headlines and no charges. It's disgusting. It's disgusting. She goes on from there. Mm. Um, it wasn't a murder. Uh, a murder is an intentional killing of another. Mm. There's clearly no intent by this Marine to kill this man. But the thing about it, Mark, is she and others intentionally ignore the fact that for the umpteenth time, this guy Neely was on board a mm. subway train actively threatening, not just yelling, threatening the passengers, mm. and he had hurt others on mm. the subway before in the not-too-distant yep. past. He had just gotten out of prison recently for assaulting a 67-year-old woman, fracturing mm. her orbital bone, breaking her nose, causing head injuries, and so on. He had just been arrested again this past February. He'd hurt a lot of people. 
but we're supposed to pretend yep. he's still the Michael Jackson imitator that used yes. to perform on the subway tracks 10 years ago. No, uh, and you you say all that, and that would apply, Megan, if we were in a rational system of justice, which Democrat cities aren't anymore. They all operate far more on the basic uh, Leninist principle of who whom. This is a black homeless man. And so that, uh, by definition, puts him in the victim category. And if I were the, uh, the, the, the guy who would put him in the chokehold, uh, if, if I were advising that guy, uh, it's a bit late for that now, but I would have uh, told him to hop in the back of the pickup truck and I'd drive him across the border into Canada because it's doubtful if they do decide to go ahead and prosecute him, whether he can actually get a, a fair trial. Uh, he's, it's not a George Floyd case, but it's part of the consequences of George Floyd, which is that Democrat cities across the United States have become increasingly lawless. And basically, when you're on the subway, you're on your own down there. Uh, mm -hmm. we, we, we've heard all the stories about people getting thrown in front of the tracks and all the rest of it, and there's no law down in the New York subway at the moment. And actually, I would say there's no law even in, in midtown Manhattan. Um, back uh, when I used to uh, guest host for uh, Tucker Carlson from New York, I used to stroll the two or three blocks from my hotel to midtown Manhattan. Never bothered with the, the car service. I'd just walk uh, up 6th Avenue, and then when the show was over, I'd walk back at night and be quite happy to pose for selfies and, and things with people. You never know now uh, in these Democrat-run cities the point at which it's all going to go south for you. Uh, so it's all very well to say, oh, well, he was just goofy and he was shouting and he was excited. And he was just a poor homeless man. There's no need to go and kill him. You never, unfortunately, the reality of American cities, and it, it should embarrass uh, the Democrat Party. I don't even know why they're actually talking about this, is they've rendered them lawless. They've turned them over. To, and you're supposed, and then if you have to make a calculate, you've got a split second to make a calculation about whether this guy is just a harmless nutter or he means you ill. And then somebody like AOC from behind her entourage gets to second guess you. It's disgusting then. Absolutely right. So well said. The, the guy who took um, some of the video that we've seen, uh, he filmed part of the encounter. His name is Juan Alberto Vasquez. He's a, a freelance journalist. He told the New York Post and WNBC that this homeless guy, Neely, came on, started making a speech, started screaming in an aggressive manner. This is a third-party mm. witness. He doesn't have a dog in his hunt. Right. Uh, right. Said he had no food, I have nothing to drink, I'm tired, and I don't care if I go to jail. Then Vasquez told WNBC that he, Vasquez, was scared and that others on board the subway were scared too. They could tell that he was behaving in a threatening manner, and that had been a long Thing for him. He has a long history mm. of doing that, at least yeah. 42 arrests for this guy over the last 10 years. Um, just to get the chronology right, the New York Times says, last arrested November 2021 for hitting that 67-year-old woman in the face. Before that, June of 2019, arrested for punching a 64-year-old man in the face during a fight in a subway station in Greenwich Village. Mm. In August 2015, arrested for attempted kidnapping after he was seen dragging a seven-year-old girl down a street. He pleaded guilty to endangering the welfare of a child there. This was not a well person. This was not no. sweet Michael Jackson, Jackson imitator. His own grandparents, with whom he spent most of his time, you know, when he did try to find housing, would not let him inside the house at night. So dangerous was he. He threatened to kill his own grandfather repeatedly. He'd been sent to Bellevue for psychiatric services time after time, said he was schizophrenic, said he was hearing voices. The city all ultimately failed him. I mean, in every single way. Uh, just now in New York, Mark, we have a mayor and sort of the governor saying, yeah, maybe we yeah. should be more open-minded to involuntary commitment for people like this. And all the local officials beneath the mayor are saying, absolutely not. The left is yeah. saying, absolutely not. You can't uh, affect their civil yeah. liberties. But now that he's dead, they want to protect him. Well, what I find in interesting uh, about what you just said is that if you were to, if you're just haphazardly following this story in the media, 
The Michael Jackson impersonation stuff is the only bit you'll take away. I don't know whether, I don't know, have no interest in the guy's Michael Jackson impersonation. I don't know whether he's doing the bad stuff. I don't know whether he's doing the early Jackson 5 stuff. Oh, look there, he's doing the, I was completely wrong on both counts. He's doing the mid-period thriller moonwalk (laughs) stuff. Right. Who the hell thinks that, This is actually the salient point of this story. Now, that 67-year-old, if you're hit uh, at the age of 67 by a big, powerful guy like this, you're not kind of quite 100% for the rest of your life. That actually is something you live with, even, even if you survive it, even if your injuries are superficial, there are consequences to that that will stay with you forever. Yet the fact that he's still, do, oh, you know, it's a thriller, uh, beat it, uh, Ben, the two of us need look, number, whatever Michael Jackson, <laughs> why is that the only angle Because as I was saying earlier, it goes back to, you know, approved victim class and approved predator class. So uh, the Marine who tackled him uh, is uh, means that this guy is in the designated victim class. And as I said, the point is you have a split second to decide. Uh, is this guy just good? Is this that charming, delightful Michael Jackson impersonator I saw two or three years ago? Or is this guy actually going to slug a little old lady in the face? You've got a couple of split seconds to decide that. And none of the people weighing in on this, AOC, the governor, the mayor, they're never going to be down there in that situation uh, because, uh, unfortunately, in this country, we're bifurcating into a Latin American uh, style society where there's the uh, ruling class behind their entourages with their private security teams. And then there's the great big mass of the rest of us who have to take our chances where we can. Exactly right. The uh, The New York Post, uh, Nicole Galinas, has an article dated yesterday saying Neely's life mattered, and so did the lives of the 27 other people violently killed on the subway since March of 2020. 27 other people. Mm. She points out that this city councilwoman, Tiffany Caban, is out there alleging that this is racist, that this is wrong, that, you know, this is murder. And this is the same person who, even as four people were killed within a month last fall on the subway, including this union steam fitter who had two kids, mm. he was on his way home from work, mm. a city field worker, s- similarly, on his way home from work late night, uh, dismissed concerns about subway violence back then, calling these one in a million events. So one in a million. Yeah. Okay, how about this? This is not one of them. You don't care about the 27 others. This no. guy, why? It's solely because of the racial element. Yeah, and it's ab- it's absolutely, a- I mean, basically, uh, the, the Democrat-run cities, New York and elsewhere, uh, have decided to create an atmosphere that incentivizes lawlessness. Uh, they pass, the, it doesn't matter, uh, stealing stuff doesn't matter unless you steal over whatever it is now, 500 bucks worth of merchandise. Uh, the, the fact that you can just be randomly thrown onto the tracks, the fact that you can be killed just coming home from work, these are things that should actually shame the city of New York. The fact is, if some guy was goofing around in a functioning subway system, you would hope that there would be someone down there representing the transit system or representing uh, the metropolis who would act and do it for you. But you're on your own down there. You are. And that's particularly true if you're, I mean, when you look at these like small Asian ladies uh, tossed onto the tracks. Uh, in that situation, you need to you need to hope that there's some guy around who's willing to get into the guy's face. Uh, and uh, this this is all there. And, and actually, it's not even ju- I mean, they have this sort of thing going on in relatively small uh, cities these days. It's actually uh, tri- trickle down lawlessness uh, starts in the big coastal uh, metropolis and then trickles down to all kinds of smaller cities. 
But you know what what's going on. Big chain stores are suddenly deciding, eh, we don't actually think we can operate in this place anymore because there's too many homeless people coming in and shooting up in the bathrooms. So we're going to close down our Starbucks uh, uh, and and just uh, they don't the cost of operating in these towns. So they're going to get worse and worse and more and more lawless. It's the realization of the broken windows theory. Uh, mm-hmm. That was Bill Bratton's who cleaned up the city under Mayor Giuliani. You don't let the broken windows stay broken. You don't let the graffiti go unprosecuted. Mm-hmm. You don't let the subway jumpers jump this turnstile because as soon as you allow people to start doing that stuff, um, they start doing worse things because they there's an element of lawlessness yeah. in the air. Couple things. Michael Jackson impersonator, sweet, innocent, don't worry. Yeah. Um, Andy No retweeted this. It was from a post on Reddit. Nine years ago, this was posted, nine years ago Mm. on Reddit. The headline of the post was, try to stay away from the Michael Jackson impersonator if you see him. Used to be all cool dancing to MJ in the subway train, but as of late, he's become a maniac. Sometime in late spring, early summer, I saw him in the train, his radio effed up, and he was angry as F, cursing and bad-mouthing commuters, screaming, what the F are you looking at? Don't effing look at me. Mm. Totally did not expect him to act this way. Ever since that day, He's just been a scary dude to me. He doesn't dress up anymore. No more dancing. Just ask for money. Occasionally shouting obscenities. Today, however, was odd. Sometime, <coughs> excuse me, in the morning, on my way to school, I'm sitting on the bench. Out of nowhere, here's someone going off, cussing up a storm, on and on. It was him. <coughs> yeah, but, <laughs> excuse but, but, me. So but, this is not the first time. No, but what's so weird about this is the desperation of, I, you know, I regard the American media as, uh, frankly, the worst in the English-speaking world. I'd rather read the Pakistani papers for an accurate <laughs> take on what's going on uh, than, than than the American papers. And what's fascinating to me is they don't care how far back they have to go. Once they've decided that someone is the victim in a story, uh, then you'll see really weird things. It'll be like some 27-year-old guy, but the only picture they'll ever use is his high school yearbook photo. Uh, yeah, and they'll be doing right. all this, oh, the gentle giant uh, and all that 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 kind of thing. And it's, uh, it's almost as if they all get the facts at 5.45 a.m. the first morning and they never deviate from that. So this guy is going to be memorialized as a Michael Jackson impersonator now and forever, even though, as you say, almost a decade ago, people were warning that the Michael Jackson guy was, in fact, a man of violence. And uh, here's and- the, here's here's what people are looking at, Mark, just to bring it home. This mm. broke in March. OK, so a, a month and a half ago, there somebody caught video of this and uh, many of us have had, if not this experience, mm-hmm. something approaching it on the subway. This mm-hmm. accurately captures the nature of riding the New York City subway. It's not the guy, Neely, who was just killed. It mm-hmm. is another guy. But this is what life is like on the subway. In this mm-hmm. situation, there is a man who I can't tell if he's homeless or if he's just out of his mind, but he's no. very clearly threatening a young man and w- woman mm. who are with what appears to be a two-year-old, I can't tell the gender of the kid, maybe boy, mm. sitting in between them. The couple does an amazing job of trying to ignore him in an yeah. obvious attempt to de-escalate, and he's getting angrier and angrier. Take a, a listen. Take them back to Europe with y'all. Yeah, me too. Yeah. 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 My God, he's getting right in the guy's face. And you have to decide. And what they do there is what everyone does in that situation. You try not to catch the guy's eye. You know, there's uh, whatever there are. There's 40 of you in the subway car and you hope uh, oh, it's one of the other 39 uh, that he, he, he tries to go for. But 
And this is why I'm, you know, I'm tired of uh, hearing this from our governing class. That is disgraceful in what's supposed to be uh, nominally a first world city, that you cannot ride the main means of transportation in that city without having that guy swearing at you, looking at you directly and using a whole big bunch of obscenities at you. Now, you can't, there's parts of American life. I happen to be in a, a big uh, court case at the moment. I can't go into a courtroom and start yelling at a judge like that. There's certain classes of Americans who manage uh, politicians and judges who expect to be insulated from things like that. Then why the hell in a democratic republic, when you ride the main means of public transportation in what's supposed to be one of the great cities of the world, should you have to put up with that? The people who run these cities, the people who run these transportation systems have consciously chosen not to enforce normal uh, societal standards on that transportation system. Yes. And as you say, it starts with the broken windows and it starts with, uh, you know, unleashing blizzards of swear words at random strangers. And then it ends up with people getting thrown on the tracks or murdered on the way home. And why, you know, New, New Yorkers reward these people by voting them back into office uh, and uh, and doing nothing uh, uh, about actually ensuring uh, basic civilized life. So like taking your two-year-old on the subway without having to have the two-year-old uh, have a terrifying, traumatizing experience of being yelled at by some crazy guy. They look like a is, high. Who you hope is merely crazy and not actually homicidal. Right. But there looked like a high likelihood of that guy attacking them if they didn't get off that mm. subway immediately mm. and it was in motion. I can only imagine mm. their fear. Um, I will say this we've now just learned the name of the Marine. It's Daniel J. Penny, uh, again, retired Marine. He served in the Marines between 2017 and 2021, was last stationed at Camp Lejeune. He's represented now. He's gotten himself a lawyer because they're looking at possibly charging this guy with possibly involuntary manslaughter all the way up to murder. Um, mm. Here's this. Here's the thing. Well, well, You've well, got, well wait a minute. Wait yeah. a minute. They're, or they'll do that whole multi-charge thing, as you know, which I also regard as uh, basically a perversion of law where they'll charge him with involuntary manslaughter and murder and three or four other things uh, in between. That guy's, you know, that guy's looking at a totally wrecked life, even if oh he manages God. to stay out of jail. They were scared. Everyone on board that subway car was mm. scared. The same mm. way that couple with the two-year-old was scared, yeah. legitimately scared. The same way I'm sure the 67-year-old woman who this guy nearly assaulted was scared. The, the elderly man he assaulted was mm. scared. So this Marine did something about it. He mm. felt threatened. The, the, the passengers on board the subway car felt threatened. He got the guy in a chokehold. Nobody was running over there and saying, this is wrong, stop. No. This is a George no. Floyd situation. I'm sure the passengers were relieved that someone protected them. Well, yeah. According to the eyewitnesses, he did struggle. He fought while he was in the chokehold, which lasted 15 minutes, and then he stopped fighting and obviously right. had died. The passengers did not realize that, nor, according to most of the eyewitnesses, did the Marine realize that, and then the subway train stopped. But these people were utterly failed by a right. city that wouldn't protect them. Thank God there was a Marine there who tried. Now, somebody's going to get to decide whether it was excessive or not, but I'd much rather be in a subway car with a guy like that Marine than without him. But nobody should get to decide whether, unless you're there, you never know. You have anybody, anybody, I mean, this is this idea of second guessing after the event is disgusting. It happens, uh, as you know, Leilani and Sophie would tell you uh, later on, after uh, the fact in the UK, where, where, you know, you wake up in the middle of the night and there's a guy coming at you with a cricket bat and you're not allowed to reach for your pistol because he's only going to smash your skull in with a cricket bag. Uh, when you're in the you have a f you have a few seconds to determine the threat level when you're down there and you're on your own. And the disgusting thing about this is uh, basically, you know, you might as well be in upcountry Waziristan uh, and uh, and and uh, a big bunch of guys from the Taliban have decided to take it out on you because 
the, the, a law-abiding society does not function on the New York subway. That's the thing. Mm -hmm. They've abandoned it to the Wild West, uh, or they, or if you prefer, the Sunni Triangle, and it's Sunni Triangle rules down there. You're on your own, and you have to make the decision. The uh, reaction from the lawmakers, just a couple. Uh, Jabari Brisport, New York State Senator, tweets out, Jordan Neely was lynched. He had no food, no water, no safe place to rest. He had the audacity to publicly yell about that massive injustice, so they killed him. Who the hell is this state lawmaker to say, where were, why didn't you step in, sir? Why didn't you encourage yeah. New York City to do more? Why didn't you make sure that we had the proper police presence? Because in New York, uh, we've seen 3,700 cops retire mm. or resign in 2022 alone. In New York City, 3,700. Right. That's right. the most since the post-9-11 exodus in 2002. Um, they're in, they defunded the police by a billion dollars before they yeah. quietly realized they needed a refund. And now the yeah. state senator is going to say, oh, it was just a homeless guy. Oh, he was just hungry. You weren't there. And Ayanna Presley, Mark, same thing. I'll give you the floor. Yeah. Ayanna Presley is the one, she's queen of defund the police right. yeah. while yeah. she's getting protected with our tax dollars. And yeah. she tweets out, he was 30 years old. Black men deserve to grow old, not be lynched on a subway because they were having a mental health crisis. Jordan deserved better account Accountability now. Well, this is this is the alliance between the New York ruling class and the New York criminal class. Uh, basically, they have decided that uh, that that they they've decriminalized certain acts. They've said that uh, you you're not uh, we don't need bail if you're accused of certain acts. Uh, we're not going to detain you if you're accused of certain acts. And they have unleashed a wave of, as a matter of. This is the this is the point. It's as a matter of policy that they have decivilized uh, New York City, and this is part of the consequences of it. And people who just do regular jobs, you know, you might work in a a pharmacy, you work in uh, Walgreen or CVS or whatever, uh, and you go into the city, and then you take the subway uh, to one of the outer boroughs home at night. They have to live with the consequences of this. These people, these nobody should listen to a New York State senator. Nobody should uh, listen to an assemblyman or whatever the hell they're they're called there. These people have failed their city, and this is the consequence of their policies. The video, which we'll show you, um, that we have part of, shows this guy down on the subway floor. And again, in this video, you can see the, mm. the, the, passengers, the passengers are not saying, like, get off of him. This is post-George no. Floyd. Nor does this Marine look like he has bloodlust in his, in his heart. There's another no. passenger trying to assist as yep. Neely struggles to get out of the other guy's restraints. Yeah. Now, look, it's it's not a pleasant thing to look at. I understand that. There's two other guys helping the Marine restrain him because mm. he continues to fight, especially because we know the outcome. But when I see this, Mark, I can't get over the fact that the city took away the cops. The city yep. would not actually provide the involuntary commitment that the mayor had pushed for because the left pushed back against it too much became a political mm. hot potato. Mm. The city passed him from psychiatric mm. hospital to psychiatric hospital without really doing much, mm. if anything, about him. The city let him commit multiple crimes yep. without really going after him. You know, he got 42 arrests, only went to jail for one of them. And mm. now a citizen steps in to protect his fellow citizens and all the ire of the world goes against him. Not the city, not the people who failed the New Yorkers on board that subway train, or Jordan Neely himself, to be honest, all against the Marine. Why? Because Marine, and most of all, because white. Yep, absolutely. And, and that's because everything has to be fitted into these lazy, uh, dreary, and misleading, but indestructible racial paradigms. Now, we just saw in the video uh, that you just played there, Megan, that uh, one of the people assisting the Marine was black himself. Mm -hmm. uh, as you said, trying to hold, as uh, as the Marines uh, holding him round the neck uh, and his, the guy's arms are still flailing and punching and lashing out, it's another black man who takes hold of one of those arms. But immediately, this 
decadent, corrupt, and depraved political class starts, oh, let's see what 19th century uh, 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 racial cliches we can apply to this. Oh, yes, lynching. We're calling it a lynching. Here's Here's a, a law-abiding black man, supposedly, participating in the lynching of the other black man. These cliches are terrible and corrosive and actually at, what, lead to this hideous politicized justice, uh, which has become the hallmark of uh, New York and similar cities. Where, As I said, if, if that guy had said to me when he got off the train, I'd have I'd said, hop in the car, I'll drive you over the Canadian border. Because uh, the, the politicization of this stuff starts immediately, and the likelihood of a fair trial recedes with every passing day of coverage like this. Mm. That you've got, of course, the race hustlers like Al Sharpton out there saying, I fought against Bernard Getz, yeah. and I'll fight this too. Bernard Getz, who is this yeah, yeah. Uh, vigilante who shot no, I well for yeah, yeah. black people in the subway years ago in the yeah. 70s. Yeah. That the, He felt he was being menaced by them, whatever. This guy, by all accounts, was this was in defense of others that that mm. uh, they felt threatened on board this train. And if you know the history of this guy, there was probably good reason to it. We'll hear more about what preceded the chokehold, but I I will predict there isn't a jury, even in Manhattan, which is very liberal, that would convict this Marine. Too many of them, especially people who have to serve on juries. We all have to do it. Um, they they ride the subway. <laughs> Those are the ones no. who are on the subway every day. They know very well how scary it's gotten down there. Well, I, I hope so, Megan, but I, I still know uh, as anyone who's attracted the attention of the so-called justice system knows that this is still going to consume a couple of years of this guy's life, and uh, he is going to be a hate figure. He's going. He's already being demonized by the left. Now, as you say, there's lots of helpless people. You look at that 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 video you showed of the young couple with their little kids sitting in between. There's a there's an obligation in functioning societies. When you see a guy like that and he's threatening little ch little children are terrified and and little old ladies are thinking, oh, am I going to wind up like that 67-year-old? Am I going to get sucker punched and going to need facial reconstruction surgery? Uh, there's an, actually an obligation uh, uh, to uh, stand up and face that kind of thing down because it shouldn't be happening. This is, this is pathetic. You know, you can say a lot of bad things about a lot of other places in uh, continental Europe or whatever, but the idea that you cannot ride the New York subway without having random strangers bellowing obscenities into your face. And you're supposed to know, as AOC says, oh, he's just some nice homeless person. Maybe he'll do a Michael Jackson impersonation. Uh, maybe he's non-binary and he'll do a Beyonce impersonation. But he's no danger to you. This is actually the beginning of the, this is a sign of civilizational decadence that no political party should actually be incentivizing. Mm, well said. Uh, we'll take a quick break. More with Mark Stein after this. We'll play the latest Media Matters edition against Tucker Carlson and Fox's pretend response. Don't go away. Look, you did the tough thing during COVID. You paid your people and pulled your business through the pandemic. And now doing the tough thing could qualify you for up to $26,000 per employee at covidtaxrelief.org. Government funds are available to reward companies with two or more employees who stayed open during COVID. It's not a loan and you don't have to pay it back. The program's complicated, but no one knows more about it than the CPAs and tax experts at covidtaxrelief.org. You pay nothing up front. They do all the work and then share a percentage of the cash they get you. Businesses of all types, including nonprofits and churches, can qualify, even those who took PPP loans, and even if you had increases in your sales. You did the tough thing for your employees during COVID. Let covidtaxrelief.org help get you up to $26,000 per employee. Visit covidtaxrelief.org, covidtaxrelief.org, covidtaxrelief.org. The campaign to ruin Tucker Carlson continues. It wasn't enough to fire the guy without telling him or his audience why. Bit by bit, we get these ridiculous leaks. It's my opinion, they're very clearly from Fox, to places yeah. like Media Matters, this far-left smear machine whose mission it is to ruin Fox mm -hmm. News, and now other conservative outlets. 
Uh, the latest was probably the funniest yet. This is what they think is going to make Tucker's audience, question mark, turn on him. Uh, watch this one. Can I ask you a question? You don't have to answer. It's personal. I'm not speaking of you, but more in general of ladies. When they go to the ladies' room and powder their noses, is there actually nose powdering going on? Sometimes. Ooh. I like the sound of that. Most of the time it's lipstick. Do pillow fights ever break out? You don't have to. Not, in, have the, to, not no. in the bed. Okay, not in the bed. Okay. <laughs> That'd be more a dorm activity. Okay. This is naughty for territory. I'm sorry. So you are such a good sport, such a good person. Thank you. I know you do, <laughs> but you do not deserve that, and I mean it with great affection. I got you, man. Which way do you want to go? Here. Yes, ma'am. Sorry. Let me tune in. And there you see his true misogyny come out against yeah, that makeup yeah. artist. Yeah, I was. This is what I, they have. I was. I was done with Tucker after he described a woman as allegedly yummy. But the fact that right. he wants to know that when you go to powder your nose, whether there's nose powdering going on, that's that's just the end of it. I can well Beyond. see why Rupert Murdoch, who is renowned around the planet as a gentleman of probity and character <laughs> and discretion. <laughs> Uh, saying we can't have this guy around us uh, any longer. Uh, this is just disgraceful. Correct. Um, now that my audience is calling this, is calling Fox News Fox Wiser because yeah. the, of their <laughs> betrayal and the fallout in the numbers after right? the betrayal. It mm. continued on Wednesday night where uh, Fox went down from the 7 p.m. in the demo. This is the number they really care about. Yeah. Down to um, from the seven to the eight, from 170 to 155. The slide continued last mm. night or Wednesday night at the 9 p.m. to 148. These are terrible, terrible numbers no, for the no, Fox News no. demo. 10 p.m., 122. No. Uh, and in that hour, MSNBC beat Fox in the demo. They are now doing the equivalent of what Bud Light did when they released yeah. the Clydesdale ad with the country guys on the porch and trying yeah. to bring in the blonde conservative to save them at 8 p.m. They're going to have Kaylee McEnany sub-host the 8 p.m. next week. Mm. I'm telling you, this is the Clydesdale moment. Let's go back <laughs> to what we think they love. This is going to yeah. save it uh, as Foxweiser yeah. continues to struggle to get itself out of its basement toilet ratings. No, they're absolutely extraordinary. As, as I mentioned earlier, I used to uh, guest host for Tucker a lot, and I'm just some, like, dilettante Canadian coming down from the hills uh, to Manhattan. But I would have been... I wouldn't have... I would have been too ashamed to go into the building the next day with these right. kinds of numbers. The one that got me, I think, was... Uh, I think it was one day last week, the, you know, when you're doing, you know this, Megan, you're thinking, have we got a strong lineup tonight? Am I going to beat uh, Rachel Maddow? And uh, ooh, even better, if I beat Hannity, that'll, you know, be good. I'll have, I'll enjoy doing that. The one guy we never had to worry about was, I can't even remember his name, the eight o'clock guy on MSNBC. Because Chris he Hayes. was such a. I'll take your word for it, because I never even bothered finding out his name, because we always knew that no matter how bad a night you have, you always beat that guy, because yeah. he's such a total loser. And I couldn't get over the way one night last week, whoever was doing Couple the nights. airport slot lost to Chris Hayes. Uh, and it's and it's not difficult to figure out uh, why. You know, you're absolutely right that, that when you get rid of a fellow, you want to not just let him go, but to damage him sufficiently so he has no value to anyone who might be minded to hire him after you. And I've been through that on a much smaller scale than Tucker. But every aspect of that, what's going on with Tucker, is familiar to me. For example... This woman who supposedly worked on the show and has uh, admitted that she never actually met Tucker, but she's being right. interviewed by people as the person who will lift the lid on the real Tucker Carlson. I had that. Uh, some guy uh, he uh, who, again, I'd never met. I'd never emailed with him. I'd never texted with, with him. I had, no, he had, I had no connection with him. And suddenly he's giving interviews, lifting the lid on the real Mark Stein. Uh, and this is just like a standard operating procedure. Tucker 
uh, by the way, Tucker's uh, done his show from the Mark Stein studio right here. So there are guys in the room right now, there's cameraman, makeup lady, who've actually had far more contact with Tucker Carlson <laughs> And these people say, oh, Thanks. I'm I, uh, the real Tucker Carlson. It isn't pretty. I'm going to give you the inside scoop, by which they mean that while he's sitting here between breaks, we keep the tape running and then leak it to Media Matters and the New York Times. It's it, not one of these is even remotely offensive. So here's what's mm -hmm. happened now. I mean, I've been on the air. My audience will vouch for me for almost 10 days now, calling yep. out who I believe is doing all of this. And that's the head of comms at right. Fox News, Irina Briganti. Mm. This is her bread and butter business. She's done it to many of us in the past. Mm. If I'm wrong, Irina, go ahead. Why don't you state it on the record? Come on and we'll debate it, right? If I'm yep. so wrong, let me, let's, let me see your phone records. Let's mm. talk about it under oath. I would love mm. nothing more. Um, mm. Now, because they're getting more heat for what they're clearly trying to do to Tucker, mm. they write this ridiculous letter through their lawyers, Wilson Sonsini, to Media Matters, Angelo Caruso, <laughs> and they write as follows. We write on behalf of Fox Corporation, this is the lawyers, to clarify any misunderstandings Media Matters may have regarding previously unaired footage that Media Matters has published in a series of articles, headline, Fox Leaks. The unaired footage is Fox's confidential intellectual property. <laughs> Fox did not consent to its distribution or publication. By the way, in the original draft, according mm -hmm. to Angelo, the first draft of this that he received from the lawyers read, Fox did consent to its distribution <laughs> or publication. Yep. Then an hour later, they had to correct their Freudian slip mm. and put back in the word not. Mm. And Fox does not consent to its further distribution or publication. This proprietary material was given to you without Fox's authorization. Who is Fox, may I ask? Lawyers at Wilson Sonsini, because I have a very good idea that your executive pre vice president in communications 100% yeah. yeah. consented by sending it over the transom to the good people yeah. at the New York Times and then later the Media Matters people. Yeah, because this is, again, standard operating procedure. As, as you know, there's a one-hour show, but in the course of that show, there's five breaks uh, in which the host is just sitting there uh, and he has a, a bit of his makeup retouched or he texts his producer with everything. The only source of all this material is from Fox News. And you have, as you say, in Irina Briganti, a figure who is notorious uh, for just combing through all that Fox intellectual property, as they put it, until she can find the five or six things that are damaging. Now, in this case, they aren't in the least bit damaging. They're, they're, uh, they make Tucker seem rather endearing. He's like uh, joshing with his makeup artiste uh, 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 about nose powdering or whatever. If that's the best they could do. this is uh, Somebody did this to me in a court case a couple of years ago, and they released all these things you say during the breaks and while you're waiting to start and everything. And it was one of the lamest things I ever, you, you know, I've ever seen. Because I don't do a lot of the, Tucker's very garrulous and he's, he's talking and he's texting, not, he's texting 24 hours a day. Uh, the one for me was totally lame. I didn't actually do any bleeping words as you occasionally uh, do, Megan. The closest <laughs> I got was I went, I was so annoyed, I went, uh, without actually reaching the vowel sound. And that's all they had, and it, and it was entered as a piece of evidence in a court case against me. We thought it was so lame that we actually put it up at my website. It's still it's still up there. And I thought that was the lamest, you know, behind-the-scenes thing you could ever come up with, because the gold standard, as you know, is that Bill O'Reilly moment. Um, oh, amazing. But the, uh, but, but, it, but, we'll do it live. But, but, yeah. That, that's fantastic. We all wish we could live up to that. And I thought this was so totally lame. We posted it at the website. I've never seen anything lamer until these bits of Tucker, uh, you know, talking about finding a lady yummy and wondering about nose powdering. If that's the it's best they've got. He was in Oxford uh, last night uh, doing some charity event or something. And the the interesting question, the, the problem that, you know, uh, Rupert uh, Murdoch has is that they've given no explanation as to why they dumped Tucker Carlson. They didn't dump him for lousy ratings because his ratings were better than anybody else. Uh, 
they so they they have not yet exp they they're like uh, they're in a worse position than Transhauser, Bush, or whatever they're called, in that they haven't mm -hmm. actually come up with any credible explanation as to why they took away the audience's favorite host. And Kayleigh McEnany and whoever else they get uh, uh, have got an impossible situation until they actually come up with a rationale for what they did. Mm -hmm. I mean, I mentioned this yesterday, but what are the odds that this Irina Briganti, who I have it on very good authority from Fox sources, taped me when I no mm. longer worked at the company, when I went to give an interview to Tucker a couple years mm. after I left Fox, and it was shortly mm. after my departure from NBC. She taped me. I mean, trust mm. me, I've got sources in mm -hmm. that building um, that she tried to get the tech guys to break down the protocols that the Tucker Carlson team yep. had put in place to make sure that no one could tape their guests and the feed that was going from Washington mm. up to New York. And she actively worked to tear them down so she could tape yep. me in the control room and the tech guys blew the whistle on her. Now, mm. what are the odds she would go through all that effort to tape me, who, yes, she can't stand, but she hates mm. Tucker just as much, if not more. Mm. But she never taped Tucker once she realized he wanted her fired, which he definitely did. Once she realized... Yep that there was a chance of getting him, like after the Dominion case. There's zero chance, right? But now mm. it's like, so let's see if Fox News actually sues Media Matters. That'll be a fun one to watch. Let's see yeah. if they yeah, actually I would, file a I would love it. I mean, this this thing that they've done, this FACO letter they've sent, <laughs> you know, basically, uh, my left hand strenuously objects to you guys running all the stuff my right hand is leaking, <laughs> which is basically <laughs> what that letter boils uh, that, there's only one source for all these texts, for all these uh, in-between uh, break time uh, conversations and all the, the rest. And that is Fox. And it's Wait, being so that's, done at can, a, can I just say, at, that's exactly right, Mark, because just to, to amplify that point, because let's, let's take a look at what they're leaking. Texts mm. that have been redacted from the Dominion mm. filings in that litigation. Mm. Who would have access to that? Dominion or Fox or the court? It's not the court mm. leaking that. It's not Dominion with its $800 million. So they have no reason mm. to do anything to jeopardize that money. No. Who's the third person that has it? It's Fox News. And then yep. we have the leaks of Tucker on tape during the commercial breaks and during the lead up to his show and the lead out to his show. Now, who would have that? Is that Dominion too? Do they have those? They turned over little jibes with Tucker mm. Carlson, joking with Piers Morgan and joking with his... No, that's Fox. That clearly is from Fox. So those are the two sources of leaks. When you look at exactly what's come out, it's 100% Fox News. It's obvious, plain as the nose on your face. Yeah, and and I will say something else too, because people um, forget that uh, uh, Tucker's executive producer was also uh, Justin let go, Wells. Justin Wells. His number two, Alexander, I know him very well. I know most of those producers. I've worked with those producers. They're very much on Team Tucker. The idea that there'd be some, uh, you know, that Alexander or Justin Wells would be leaking this stuff. Never. No, uh, no. it's what is happening is that they're do he's, he's sitting in his studio in Maine or, you know, as I said, uh, sitting in this room and it's being fed back to New York and someone at the highest levels like Madame Briganti is recording this stuff and has been doing it for years just on the off chance that one day it will prove useful. And what it tells you as well is that none of these, the content of these things, oh, he's, he's, he's being outrageously misogynist by talking about powdering your nose. Oh, he's making a reference to January the 6th. Oh, he's making a reference to the Dominion case. What it tells you is that this is, these are none of the reasons why Tucker is out at Fox, and it's uh, something entirely different. Because if it was Dominion, if it was January the sixth, if it uh, they then Fox would not be leaking uh, this stuff. But it's yeah. pathetic. The, again, I, I was disparaging the American media. I can't get over these hack journalists congratulating that New York Times guy. Oh, great reporting! He's not reporting anything. He's being fed this stuff yes. continuously. Uh, down some pipeline from uh, Madame Briganti straight into his email inbox and is just having a grand old time with it. Exactly right. Have some discretion about how you're being used by an mm. angry PR person mm. uh, in a battle she couldn't win before mm. and now is determined to win now that he's mm. gone. Um, I'll say this. This is why Fox can never win a lawsuit with Tucker. 
and mm. is going to do what he wants ultimately in, mm. the, in the resolution of this because they cannot afford a litigation in which mm. he gets his lawyer cross-examining Irina Briganti, in which yep. we'll get all of her emails, all of her cell phone records, yep. all of her desktop records of who she called and when. Oh, yes, we will see them mm. all. And we'll mm. know exactly what she was up to. And we'll get the ones of Suzanne Scott and we'll get yep. the general counsel. We'll get them all. Because mm. if this has been a company-wide effort to ruin him post-termination, they mm. will pay. Trust me, they yep. will be sued for doing this. They will pay. And yep. that is why I firmly believe Tucker should breach. He should breach. He should give yep. up whatever, the 30 million bucks that is still Amen. owed to him. He will make they it up very they easily breached it. in the private market. That's exactly right. He'll, he'll have an argument of prior material breach. And even if he doesn't, yep. he'll make more money if he goes private. He got a $100 million offer on this show the other day. He should yep. breach. He should walk out of there and he should not let them muzzle him for the entire election season, which is what they're trying to do as they rebuild their audience. All right, Mark, no, stand by. They've, bro Mark comes they've back. broken their contract. Go, yeah, thanks. Thanks, right. Megan. Stand Go by. Fun. Mark comes back. No, no, no. He's coming back right after this quick, quick break. We're going to talk coronation. Experts say that China is hoarding a massive amount of food. They will soon have over two-thirds of the globe's corn reserves, over half of its rice, and over half of its wheat. But when asked about it, China misleads. One China expert says that they, of course, would never admit to something like that. Well, what does China know that we don't? When it comes to global food shortages, China is the canary in the coal mine. You see, China's the world's number one food importer. They rely on the rest of the world to keep their people fed. So they cannot afford to mess this up, or there could be riots or civil panic or worse. That's why it's a smart idea to stock up on your own, on a kit of the best-selling Four Patriots survival food. Create your own stockpile of the best-selling Four Patriots survival food kits. Hand-packed in the USA, the kits are compact and stack easily. They have different delicious breakfasts, lunches, and dinners, and their five-star reviews on the website rave about the flavor and the taste. Right now, you can get 10% off your first purchase of Four Patriots survival food by typing in the code MK at checkout. Go to four, numeral four, patriots.com, Use that code MK and get your 10% off your first purchase of 4Patriots Survival Food. Again, that's 4Patriots.com. Use that code MK. Mark, I definitely want to ask you about the coronation, but I've got to ask you about the breaking news that we just got across the transom. Thank God Rochelle Walensky is stepping down as the head of the CDC. <laughs> Praise Jesus, she's mm. going. As of June, the White House putting out a nice statement about her. Oh, she saved lives with her steadfast and unwavering focus on the health of every American. As director of the CDC, she did all sorts of great things. You can fill in the rank, the rest of the blanks. Mm. Um, there probably wasn't anyone more hysterical about COVID than Rochelle Walensky. She hasn't acknowledged any of her mistakes. Even as Fauci comes out and admits masks, maybe 10% around the edges. Really, no. they only work if it's the N95 or KN95 perfectly fitted notwithstanding what he and the CDC did to our kids, did to us yep. for two plus years. She hasn't even gone that far. She's still pretending she has a perfect track record. And now she's just quietly going to ride off into the sunset. Well, it's interesting to me because we've had rule by experts for the last three years, which is what the left claims to want. You know, if you talk about climate change, they say, well, wait a minute, are you are you a climatologist? Uh, no, actually, I'm a tap dancer. Well, then you have no right to weigh in. Uh, I don't think these lockdowns are a good idea. Well, wait a minute, are you a virologist? Uh, no, I'm a dog sledder. Well, then you have no right to weigh in. We've had rule by experts for three years and everything is as bad as it can get. The CDC has basically destroyed its brand during that time. It used to be that, you know, people thought the WHO in Geneva was a bit iffy, but the CDC had quite a good reputation. They basically, they basically done a Bud Light on their brand these last three years. And mm -hmm. nobody, I mean, R goodbye, Rochelle Walensky, and good riddance. But actually, I don't think anybody who's been associated with the last three years should be in any public position whatsoever, because it's uh, it's as it's been as big a cat catastrophe uh, for sound government as you could imagine. Here is just a reminder of her steady leadership, as praised mm. by the White House today. Who could forget this moment? When I first started at CDC about two months ago, I made a promise to you. I would tell you the truth, even if it was not the news we wanted to hear. Now is one of those times when I have to share the truth and I have to hope and trust you will listen. I'm gonna pause here, I'm gonna lose the script, and I'm gonna reflect on the recurring feeling I have of impending doom. 
we have so much to look forward to, so much promise and potential of where we are, and so much reason for hope. <laughs> but right now, I'm scared. Oh, God. <laughs> that, Tears. No, that that is basically, I mean, it's not really funny because half the population uh, takes it seriously and they're still going around with the tatty old masks hanging off their nose, thinking they're going to die if some little particle manages to penetrate their tatty old <laughs> uh, mask. But that's this is actually, you know, I'm going to go off the script now. We're all doomed, head for the hills. I mean, <laughs> no one should ever take her seriously ever again. I mean, no, even the... No. <laughs> she actually, she and Irina Briganti, who you were talking about earlier, should should team up because it's the same thing. It's totally fake. Oh, I'm going to go off the script now. But fortunately, yeah. the bit of script I'm going off is has been preloaded in my prompter. So... <laughs> We are all uh, doomed. I mean, I just... It's so true. Oh, my God, I won't miss her at all. Sadly, we're about to get somebody just like her. There's no way they're going oh, to yeah. get meaningful change yeah. over there. But mm. we'll not miss Rochelle even a little. Mm. Before mm. we turn to the UK, can I ask you about, now we've had Tucker lose his job. Don Lemon got fired, same day. Um, mm. And I have been saying the next to go has got to be Joy Reid. I mean, she's just... She's in the Don Lemon camp of just being in a hysteric. She's also like Rochelle mm. Walensky and hysteric, only she's a thousand mm. times worse than Rochelle Walensky. At least Rochelle Walensky is like a medical doctor who, mm. you know, you could respect on paper, even though she spewed nonsense and ruined our lives for two years. <laughs> Wait, I'm talking myself out of it. But Joy <laughs> Reid is on TV every night. Everyone is racist. And literally everyone in the Republican Party is evil and racist. And I got to tell you, Mark, I think even at MSNBC, which is still owned by NBC News, mm. If she said this on her nightly show, I've got to believe they'd have to do something about her. I do. I like. I know she says crazy racist stuff every night, but this she went on the most unhinged rant over on TikTok. We pulled a little bit so you could get just a sampling. Would you watch this? The Republican Party at this stage in its development is at war with the rest of us. They're coming for your birth control. They're coming for gay marriage. They're coming for education. One thing that they will never do is protect a single child from getting slaughtered in school because their only true worship is guns. They're coming for black power. You think they're gonna stop by just evicting troublemaking black lawmakers in one state? Anyone who displeases them is on the menu. They want to turn every state into their white Christian nationalist hell. When they lose enough elections, they will moderate. And then we will have two normal political parties again. We need to vote them all out. It's DEFCON 1, y'all. Take action and stay woke. Oh, my God. Care to respond? Uh, I... I mentioned that guy at eight o'clock who used to be opposite Tucker on MSNBC. Chris Hayes. I, I said, uh, you know, you knew whatever, even if you did a totally crap, worthless show, you'd still beat that guy. The other, the other one you'd always beat was Joy Reid. And as I say, I say this just as like as a dilettante Canadian who comes down from the hills a couple of days a month. But the, um, the, the ability of people to sustain a high-level media career, even when there is no obvious audience for you, is mm -hmm. astonishing to me. And Joy Reid is an exemplar of that and, the, uh, and of the dishonesty and bad faith of uh, the media discourse in this country. Because on the one hand, you have people uh, making a huge, oh, can you believe that uh, Tucker called a person of the opposite sex yummy? And then on the other hand, we have the official explanation for Joy Reid's uh, notoriously homophobic Twitter feed from whatever it is, five, ten years ago, that, that that was all just somebody hacked into her account. Now she's mourning that the uh, Republican Party is, uh, is going to come after gay marriage. Well, the Joy Reid of five, ten, whatever it was years ago would be celebrating uh, yeah, that. So point. I regard her as an entirely dishonest 
uh, figure. And, uh, and as I said, one of those slightly mystifying ones in, in that uh, she could just sort of cruise on for year in, year out with these kind of deathbed numbers, and it doesn't, and it never seems to impact her career at all. It's, it's extraordinary to me that. How does any Republican go on, on NBC News when this woman is in the same building calling them names like this, saying that, mm-hmm. that all Republicans want to turn every state into their white Christian nationalist hell? It's DEFCON 1. She goes on to say, We're, we damn near Gilead. Wake up, wake up, take action, and stay yeah. woke. Okay. Well, Ch- Charles Krauthammer, the late Charles Krauthammer, used to have a very good line about Fox News. He, he said, oh, Rupert Murdoch uh, stumbled on this niche demographic that was a little underserved, uh, half the country. And right. that's actually who uh, uh, Joy Reid is going up against. And, and what is extraordinary to me is it, it means you're so dislocated from the... You know, I think every person on the right... Uh, understands uh, what it's like to to, to live in a left wing culture because it's all around you. It's in the movies, it's in the pop songs, it's at the mainline churches. Uh, the default setting of uh, American society is to the left. Whereas if you're on the left, you never really are aware, uh, except in these cartoon terms. I mean, it used to, I used to get these people who would complain. Um, that they took their car in to be serviced. And uh, while the grease monkey was working on it, he retuned the radio from NPR to Rush. So they, the, the car's finished <laughs> being worked on. They get back in the car, they drive out onto the highway, and the radio comes on, and it's Rush <laughs> blaring away. <laughs> That's the only moment when people like Joy Reid are forced uh, to, to, to just intersect with the half of the population that does not think like them. And you would have to be crazy to demonize, you know, 150 million Americans the way she does there. Mm, well, that, well said and true. Uh, I think you've made a good point. Um, okay, we got to talk about the coronation. Happens tomorrow, uh, where King Charles is officially, I get. I mean, is he not officially king right now? I'm not exactly sure what the coronation does. No, he became officially king uh, four seconds after his mother died at Balmoral. And if you remember that first announcement from the palace said, Her Majesty the Queen died at whatever it was, 3.18 p.m., uh, the king will leave Balmoral and return to Buckingham Palace uh, tomorrow morning. So he becomes the king, you know, that's the old line, uh, the king is dead, long live the king. That's the old line. And this is just really a thousand-year-old anointing ceremony, supposedly, that emphasizes the compact between the king and uh, God, the king of kings, as they used to say. I don't know whether they use that phrase anymore. Um but that's that's what the 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 ceremony is meant to represent. Now he's sort of undermined that a bit by filling the congregation with all these uh, TV stars and the like, which doesn't aid contemplation of the Almighty, as it were. Who? What TV stars does he have there? What do you mean? Well, they would like the uh, I think the hosts of uh, Strictly Come Dancing. Uh, are going to be there, uh, which is the British original of Dancing with the Stars. Uh, ah, so oh. they're going to have, I think the judges from Strictly are going to be there. As the, and I think Anton Deck, whom you may well have seen in one of the funniest scenes in Love, actually. So, oh. <laughs> okay. Uh, I, well, what about, what about this, Mark? As I read, you know, he's kind of, instead of using the traditional coronation oil, which is mm. substances from the intestines of sperm whales or secretions mm. from the glands of small mammals like civets, uh, mm. the BBC reports that instead he will be using a mixture of olive oil, rose, jasmine, cinnamon, orange blossom, and mm. sesame out of mm. his environmental sensitivities. He will also be um, making sure to represent different faiths at the ceremony. Yeah. Um, to reflect the ethnic diversity of modern Britain. He will be banning the, is it Kohinoor diamond? 
uh, that yes. will not make an, ap- an appearance at the coronation. It's one of the biggest and most beautiful glittering British crown du- jewels, mm. but there's been a whole kerfuffle over its provenance. I mean, basically, I looked into this at one point. Everyone stole yeah. it from everyone. Everyone stole yeah, it from yeah, everyone. Yeah, no, no. Good luck finding no, somebody who doesn't who has pure hands behind that diamond. No, it, the, the, every change he's made since 1950, the 1953 coronation basically is for the worse. As you said, he's not using traditional holy oil. He's using basically the salad dressing from a pretentious <laughs> DC restaurant. Uh, <laughs> uh, that's what he's going to be anointed with. Good, good, good luck with good luck with that. Um, it's all. It's all. You know. Harry and Meghan, when they're doing their at war with uh, the palace stuff, obscures the reality that, in fact, they're all on the same page. The king, the heir, and the spare all agree on this super woke rubbish. So we're going to have a kind of uh, a wokey woke coronation that I, I'm, I'm actually astonished. It's whatever it is uh, now, uh, six, seven months since the queen died. And I'm astonished at how things have gone south quite so quickly, and and I'm uh, I'm I'm also kind of slightly amazed at the way uh, the open contempt for him uh, has actually. I thought they'd wait until the coronation, but in 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 fact, uh, he's he's played it so badly that I I think he's put a real question mark over the monarchy. Uh, around so? the world, and it's not. It's and Saturday isn't going to do anything for him on that front. How? How so? How has he played it badly? Well, I think, as I said, because he's it, well. For a start, he thinks he's a great thinker. The Queen, in my you know relatively modest experience with her, was actually an informed and intelligent woman. But she was intelligent enough. This is her central insight that the queen doesn't have to do, she just has to be. Mm -hmm. And the problem with this guy is he thinks he's one of the world's great thinkers on climate change and slavery and all kinds of other things. And he's weak. And at the same time, he's actually weak about what a king is meant. I mean, there have been some really pathetic things. He was caught on mic with his Australian prime minister, you know, uh, murmuring, oh, I'm not sure anyone really wants me down there. Uh, his uh, Canadian governor general, the, the the king's viceroy in in Canada, was reduced to pleading on TV, you know, oh, won't you give this new king, just give him a bit of a chance. He's not as bad as it seems. This is, the, this is actually a worse start to a new reign even than... Uh, his grandfather, who took over after uh, the Duke of Windsor's abdication. So I'm worried it's all just going to head south very quickly. Hmm. Well, at least we won't have to look at Meghan Markle uh, sitting there at the coronation (laughs) acting like she's Team Windsor. (laughs) Mm. She's going to stay at home. Harry's jetting in for about two minutes and returning back to his home in Montecito. And Mm. I, for one, am delighted that we have been spared that. You? Mm. Oh, yeah. I I think this was just a disaster for the royal family. Uh, but but the fact uh, that the king, again, is being weak because he's they're sort of half in, half out. And I think at a certain point, you just have to say, look, you know, if we're going to if we're going to have any communication, it's going to be in the back channels. But this stuff you're going around saying to Oprah and in your stupid book and all the rest of it, you're on the outs as far as the royal house of the UK, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, blah, 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 all the way to Papua New Guinea and the Solomon Islands. As far as that's concerned, you're out and you're staying out. So don't even bother doing any of this. Will I get invited to the coronation? Because you're not going to be invited to anything from now yeah, on. He, and he, does he should need take a lesson. He should take a lesson from Meghan Markle and the way mm. she treats her family. That's how yep. King Charles should yep. be treating these two. They've done far more to deserve it than Meghan's dad has. I'll tell you that. Oh yeah. All right, Mark. Always a pleasure. Great to see you. Come back soon. No, always a, always a pleasure to see you too, Megan. And you're the only one who, uh, on that Tucker situation, you're you're the only media outlet that actually says anything worth listening to on this subject. So <laughs> it's you. been great form the last couple of weeks. Thanks a lot, Thank Megan. Thank you very much.
Thank you. And we're going to be right back to talk a bit more about the coronation, the banishment of Ms. Markle, plus Dylan Mulvaney with a new video for you. Stand by. Mm. The coronation is tomorrow. Harry's heading there. Megan's not. Here to talk about it all. Uh, happy to have two Brits back with us, two of our favorite Brits, Sophie Corcoran and Leilani Dowding. Great to see you again, ladies. Hi, good to be here. All right. So I, I was just saying with Mark Stein, I'm glad she's not going. I really, I, who wants to sit and look at her, try to pretend like she's there in any way supportive of the royal family? She hates them, despite the fact that they made her a mega star. They gave her all this opportunity to earn tons of millions and millions of dollars, all roots back to them and gave her a royal wedding and the Diana's jewels and the queen and all of it, she hates them. So why would we have to look at her, Sophie, sitting there pretending otherwise? It was annoying enough at the queen's funeral. Well, no, and it is, it's quite good. I give her a due. She's finally figured out that we don't want her back in Britain. She will never be welcome back in Britain. You can't come here, trash everything, our royal family, everything we are as a country when we have given you so much and expect to be welcomed back with open arms. And she's finally realised that. And good old Mr Green's jetting it over as usual. Can't wait for him to probably lecture us on climate change when he's got a private jet over here for one day, as the usual. So he's off doing his normal hypocritical whining nonsense. So spare us that, but at least he's only here for 24 hours. But I would rather it be none. Yeah, spare us. Exactly right. He was just at the UN lecturing us all about how we needed to be greener. You got to give up your SUV and turn down your heater or your AC, but he can literally take a private jet over there for like a four hour stint, then turn right back home and go home to his huge mansion in Montecito, which is not very green. Um, what about him, Leilani? Because he was part of the same Netflix documentary and fully on board with calling half of the British people racists because they voted for Brexit. So now he's going to come in front of that same group and I pray that they break decorum and boo him like I will be doing from my home. <laughs> and if I turn it on, I, I feel a little bit the same as Mark about it all, actually. But if I turn it on, I will be booing him too, because it is, it's always hypocritical. Um, you know, he'll come over, he'll lecture us, he'll fly back on his private jet, he'll jet over here. Um, and yeah, he was there with, with Megan calling us all racist because, you know, and then obviously then he backtracked and blamed it on the media. But that was, you know, years later. He didn't backtrack on, he didn't say, no, actually, let's put a stop to this now. At the time when the media reported it, we knew what Megan was trying to say. He didn't speak up at the time. Um, and then obviously because of the backlash he's received and how the British people have felt about it, he then, you know, goes back, a couple of years later, and he thinks it's all going to be fine when he comes over here. So, no, I will be booing. I'm already booing now, actually. Yeah. So she knew she'd get booed. I mean, her approval ratings are a minus 33. She swung to minus 33 uh, when you count up the approvals and the disapprovals. So she knew she'd get booed. That's almost certainly why she's not coming, though there was some reporting out of Great Britain that Princess Kate said she's not coming. Trust me, <laughs> she may not come. So we don't know what the truth is. But Omid Scobie, who is basically the stenographer for this pair, comes out. I know Sophie's already recoiling. He comes out with a report um, saying, Megan decided not to attend the coronation. She is aware of just how much the spotlight goes on her when she sets even a foot near the story. So that, Sophie, is why she's chosen not to attend. So as out of deference, you see, to King Charles's moment. Listen, Scooby-Doo, he chats a load of rubbish. So I don't even know why we call him a rural commentator, because he doesn't know anything. He's basically just their mouthpiece. But let's be quite honest. I don't care about Harry and Meghan. The coronation is not about Harry and Meghan. It's about King Charles and it's about the British people. So what I want really is to just not hear about them at all. I don't want the press to be writing a load of boring articles about them and making everything about them as they tried to do when the Queen died. This is not about Harry and Meghan. They're irrelevant to us. Most of us don't even consider them as part of our royal family. We don't like them. This is about the British people and having a great, joyous celebration and loving Britain. And the thing I love about the coronation is, finally, for one time, it's not shameful to be patriotic. I feel like Britain is the only country in the world where 
it's you are looked down upon if you like where you are from and that you should be embarrassed if you celebrate the country that you were born in. So I love the fact that, you know, the streets are lined with Union Jacks, but it does frustrate me that why are we only doing this in the coronation? Why can't we do it 24-7 like everybody else? But the coronation mm. does bring about some really stupid debates, namely from American woke professors um, about the whole reparations debacle. We have the consistent debate of, you know, should the royal family apologise for their slavery? Every single, you know, minor or major royal event there is. And the answer is no, they shouldn't, because the royal family, you know, was the current is, was not responsible for any of those behaviours. And our royal family, if you pick up a history book, please, you would understand that they oversaw the majority of decolonisation. And we have so many stupid discussions about reparations, but the fact of the matter is, why on earth would the British taxpayer, who none of us alive here own slaves, give our taxpayer dollars to people who never were slaves? It doesn't make any sense. The people who mm-hmm. want the reparations were not in any way victims of slavery. No, no one alive now was in that period, and no one alive here today owned slaves. So it's just nonsense. Why on earth yeah. are we apologizing for the sins the of The city of San Francisco is over here about to do the same thing. They're approving measures to pay reparations to people who not only are not descended from slaves, but might not even be black. You just have to decl- you have to have to have been, been saying you're black, identifying as black for 10 years. Okay. Okay, we'll see how that works out. Uh, but can I just ask you, Leilani, because the absurdity of this statement. She is aware of just how much the spotlight goes on her when she sets uh, even a foot near the story. That's why she's not going. That's such a lie. Meghan Markle's never seen a camera she doesn't want to be in front of. That is, This is, of all the reasons that she is not attending the coronation, this is nowhere near the list. She's not going because she knows she's going to get booed. Yeah, I th- I agree with you 100%. There's no way it's because she doesn't want to be in the spotlight. She always wants to be in the spotlight. That is everything about her. That's why she did... Um, the documentary on Netflix. That's why she spoke to Oprah because that's all she's ever wanted. um, And it's all she wants now. But she knows that when she steps foot in England, people do not want her here. They do not like her. They, um, they know that they, that she's called them racist so many times. She's blamed half the country for being racist, for wanting Brexit. I mean, they're supposed to be royals. They should keep out of political statements like that. So, yeah, she is definitely staying out of the country because she knows how we feel about her. But she's trying to get attention here. She um, signed with WME, William Morris uh, Endeavor, uh, and represented by Ari Emanuel, who's this big Hollywood power agent. Um, she calls herself a global icon in the press release that they put out. She, okay, doesn't really work when you have your agent say it about you like that. Like it's, it kind of <laughs> makes you look bad, Megan. I mean, you're just doing it all wrong uh, as usual. Um, she revealed this new look in this like picture of her that came out of their Montecito mansion. I don't know what she's done, but she's done something. I don't know, it's like something's going on with the jawline. Could be a Zempic. I don't know. <laughs> I'm not sure what it is, but I'm just saying like something's going on there, ladies. Oh. You, know, you know it, I know it, and the, our countrymen know it. And then the third thing was she appeared at, I think, a Lakers game with Harry on what was supposed to be the kiss cam in a, sort of an interesting moment. I'll show it to you, get your reaction. The camera finds them. He kind of goes to kiss her. She turns away like she's not going to get take the kiss. And then he looks like he's sort of having a holy, a holy shit moment like, oh, my God, what are they going to write about me? I went to kiss her and she turned away. I don't know what's happening there, but she's definitely trying to get her name in the headlines in advance of, you know, King Charles's big day. Am I wrong? I mean, when is she not trying to get her name in the headlines for one? But it just makes me laugh. This woman could straighten her hair and all of the Megan cult all of a sudden think she's the modern reincarnation of Jesus because she's just straightened <laughs> her hair. But I don't really understand that part. But she's always trying to get her head, you know, her name in the headlines. Um, I don't think the relationship between Meg and Harry is good. Let's be honest. I don't think anybody can pretend that it was good. You know, she wasn't really present when Spare was coming out. So to be honest, I, I wouldn't be surprised if that relationship crumbled pretty soon. Mm. And I think it's right. good that you know she's staying back home to uh, create more headlines for herself there. But she also knows that her staying home will create headlines here. She yeah. knows it. I, she meanwhile, we're not the only ones who are feeling this way, Leilani, about Prince Harry. There are protests over there, um, royalists, people who are in support of the royal family, but not him, actually camping out uh, outside for the coronation. We have just a bit of a bit of this from Times Radio. Watch. I don't think they like Meghan. 
No, we don't. No. You don't like Megan? No. Why is that? It's not because we're racist, because we're not racist. I hate people saying that to us. Oh, you don't like her because we're racist. No, we're not bloody racist. We don't like her attitudes. If Harry were to be in the olden days, it's a tr they would tell me he's a traitor. What, what do you mean you by that? You, can, you, can, you can't betray your own people. You can't betray your family. Hmm. Just a little sampling of how the, some of the British people are feeling. But the polls reflect, it's not just those ladies. Like, the, the public in the UK, even more so than in America, has turned on both of them. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm not even a royalist, but I feel the same way about take them as a family. When you betray your family like that, when you uh, just write a book about them, take, you know, the last words of your grandma and, and, and what she's saying on the deathbed and just, you know, put them out there for everybody to read. and share all those private moments, of course, it's going to turn so many people off. And it's like me, you know, people think I'm, you know, I really despise Harry and Meghan. I cannot stand them. It doesn't mean I necessarily am a royalist and I love them, but I see it for what it is. I see what they do as a family. And that's what is important to me. How do you treat your family? And also, how do you treat the general public? Are you going to call them racist, climate change deniers whilst, you know, traveling on a private jet? So that's how it is for me. I just see Meghan and Harry as two people that completely and utterly betrayed their family in search of limelight and fame and just making absolutely as much money as they can. Um, well, Meghan, Harry didn't really need to do that, but, you know, Meghan and and, and, and so forth. Yeah, and when Meghan and Harry dis disassociated from the royal family did need dough. Um, and it's not just his family, her, her family too. The dad had a stroke. The dad does not appear to be in great shape, her dad, Thomas Markle. He gave an interview, and um, it's to Australia's Seven News. It's him, it's his son, Thomas Jr., and the estranged daughter, Samantha Markle, who the definitely bad blood between her and Meghan. But here's a bit of that exchange. It's SOT7. So we assume that because of the international press coverage, Meghan knows you've had a stroke. Of course he has to know. I'm taking it from that that she hasn't called you. No. No phone call? No. How long has it been now? It's been four years. So just radio silence? Exactly. If she doesn't turn up for a stroke, if that doesn't move her, what would? Mm, good question. It's dark. I mean, it's very dark. I've said before, some of us actually did lose our dads. In my case, when I was 15 and my dad was 45, and I would give anything to have the opportunity to call him up and spend some time with him. Her dad is there. He's not doing well. He's asking for another chance. And I'm sorry, but this cold-hearted witch in her mansion in Montecito won't deign to give him the time. I think it's disgusting. Yeah, me too. But to be honest, she's got a track record. She's betrayed every single member of her family. She's betrayed every single one of her friends. She will soon betray Prince Harry because that's all she ever does. For her, Megan's all about herself. She's about nobody else but herself, whether it's friends or family. And one thing that always comes out whenever, you know, Omi Scobie's talking about Megan or she and herself is talking about Megan, it's all about revealing her truth. And it is quite just that. It is her truth. It is certainly not the truth. And that is what yeah. you get with Megan because her truth is very different to what's actually happening and is very different to the reality. But she lives in a completely different world to the rest of us. She, you know, she thinks everybody owes her something. She thinks the world revolves around her. And it's just quite frankly ridiculous. She's a hypocrite in everything she does. She wants privacy, yet throws every single member of her family and her friends under the bus. She comes here and gives all of these woke green speeches and then does the exact opposite. She just lives in this parallel universe that she creates in her mind. And the rest of us are just sitting there watching it and just thinking, you're a liar, you're a hypocrite, and you're not even on mm. the same planet that the rest of us are. Well, she's not going. And the other person who's not going is President Joe Biden. So Leilani, what do we think of that? He sent Dr. Jill. Dr. Jill is going with one of the grandchildren, not, not the one that the Bidens refused to acknowledge because <laughs> he had it with somebody who they consider illegitimate. It's terrible what they're doing to that girl. But in any event, he's going, uh, she, Dr. Jill is going, he's not going. And Trump comes out and says it's very disrespectful of him not to attend. He says, um, though it is hard for him to do it physically. Of course, got that. 
got that dig in. But there are there's folks over in Great Britain too who are who feel snubbed because President Biden just took a trip to Ireland and prioritized doing that and decided to skip this. And it feels sort of like a middle finger. Oh, yeah, I mean, it's crazy, isn't it? If he's going to blame that he physically can't do it, yet he's gone over to Ireland, it's absolute nonsense. I mean, personally, I'm glad he's not here. I'm glad he has no part in it. I mean, they probably couldn't have enough people to change his diapers or something between the ceremony. But, you know, who knows why he's not coming over, really? But it is a bit of a snub for those people that actually do like him. I mean, he has nothing really that he could possibly contribute with his uh, poor speech and what have you. Mm, well, he's not going. Uh, American presidents in the past have skipped the coronation for a British monarch. Then President Eisenhower skipped the coronation of Queen Elizabeth II, choosing instead to send a delegation to the event. But we're supposed to be BFFs. So there seems to be a bit of a message in there, Sophie, especially given the fact that he did just go of all places to Ireland, but he couldn't find it within him, you know, to go celebrate this moment. I mean, we're kind of talking about the controversies around it, but like this is a very celebratory moment for Great Britain. This is going to be, I think, a really fun, joyous day tomorrow. Of course. And we've always really, uh, you know, prided ourselves as the UK with our relationship with the US. And that's kind of the, the relationship that we have with the US was actually one of the main motivators of Brexit, because we felt that we had a better relationship with the US and we could have a better partnership with the US than we could have done the EU. And now, obviously, he went to Ireland. Racist. His, his big protocol with Brexit is one of the biggest issues is the Northern Ireland Protocol, which is obviously where the border sits between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland, and it brings in tensions. And he's been lambasting our government and getting involved in those discussions, which he has no place to be involved in with the relationship with Ireland. And let me tell you, my father is Irish. He was born in the Republic of Ireland, and even I don't call myself Irish. So this man that's like eight, one millionths Irish or whatever he is, he's just not Irish. I'm not having it. He's not Irish. My own father is Irish, and even I don't claim to be Irish. But oh. the thing is with Mr. Biden is that if he's not physically well enough to come over to our coronation, what makes him think that he is physically well enough to be a president when there is wars breaking out everywhere? The well, that's Trump is- saying he's not well enough, to be clear. It's and not he, Biden and his team. I mean, it's Trump saying, oh, he can't go because he obviously can't handle it. I mean, he's not, though. I mean, the guy can't even walk up the stairs sometimes and, and even dress himself. So to be quite honest... You know, lots of Americans judge us in the way that we do of our royal family, but I'm going to judge you now because if you have re-elected him as president, you have got to be insane. <laughs> well, I'm looking forward to the pomp and circumstance because nobody does it better than the Brits. It's going to be super yeah, fun yeah. to watch, you know, like the, all the royal guards and the hats and the, you know, just everything. I realize you haven't done it in 70 years, but I feel like you're going to nail it. And it's, it happens while we're still kind of asleep, I think, by like five in the morning here. But when we wake up, we'll get to see the replays and it's, it's going to be fun. So congratulations on what should be a joyous day for you. Now, your your comment about President Biden being like basically 1% Irish, really, brings me to some of our news stories that I wanted to go over with you. And this, I always love the stories about what we call the pretendians, the pretend Indians, the pretend Native Americans here in America. And there's another one. My God, you can't stop these people. They love, love, love to do this. They like to pretend that they're Native American, and then they always get caught. Okay, the latest is a woman who, of course, worked at UC Berkeley, one of our farthest left colleges, institutions out in California. Uh, She claims she was Native American for her entire life. She is as white as the driven snow. She is no part Native American. But this woman has been using it at every turn. Um, Apparently, she got outed by another person. an assistant professor at Brown University and a Cherokee Nation citizen who says they used to be friends, wrote a letter on her own blog saying, this woman's story fell apart in a New York minute just as soon as Keene first started looking into it over a year ago. But now the pretendian, uh, again, her name is Elizabeth Hoover, this associate professor at Berkeley, is coming out saying, I am sorry that I uncritically lived an identity based on family stories without seeking out a documented connection to these communities, and I caused harm. Now, this woman's published books and articles about Native American food sovereignty, okay, and other issues. She never had the proper documentation to confirm her claims. She said, I should have done my due diligence as though she had no reason to believe she wasn't. Um, You know, she had some claim to a great-great-grandma that she just, you know, didn't think to question. And it took this other professor two minutes 
to figure out this was all a lie. I call BS. This woman knew. She milked it. She saw opportunities to, to be a pretendian. That's why she did it. It's absolutely pathetic. And I love calling these people out. Thoughts on it, Leilani? Well, this is the problem when you have the this like positive discrimination and these stupid diversity and inclusion goals, isn't it? That people are going to just try and pretend and, you know, the same way they do when they're male, trying to pretend they're female. I'm surprised you just didn't say, oh, I identify as American Indian and therefore I am. So yes. you know, this is where we're at. Maybe in a few years time that will actually be possible. But it seems like she just was completely living a lie and she was happy to do it because, you know, it was financially rewarding to her because she yeah. could play along with these diversity inclusion goals rather than just being, you know, who she was and trying to publish whatever she was writing in that way. Yes, it's and everybody knows when it comes to claiming that you're a Native American, the checking of it to actually figure out whether you have the bloodline that goes back to, is important. I mean, you really are, you know, we call it stolen honor when you pretend that you're a member of the military and you're not, or you're stolen glory when you pretend that you had some amazing war feat that you didn't. This is really a stolen ancestry situation, and it does matter. I guarantee you this woman probably wouldn't have been accepted at UC Berkeley, which is still a prestigious school, if she hadn't played the Native American card. So she took the spot from somebody who actually was Native American, who have been historically oppressed in our country, and probably could have really used that spot. So shame on her. It's disgusting, and I love these groups who are now calling these, it's always women. It's always, When it comes to the pretendians, they're all women, from Elizabeth Warren, or as we used mm -hmm. to call her Chief Lies a lot, on down. Okay, Let's, you mentioned um, pretending that you're a woman when you're actually a man, and that brings us to Dylan Mulvaney. Dylan has now given an interview to fellow leftist Chelsea Handler. And Deb, do we have that third thought that we were looking for? Okay, and they got into the discussion of, quote, quote, trans children, which is not a thing, but the left is making it a thing. And here's a little bit of that. Yeah, I think one of the most offensive things to hear is people who are, are talking about, you know, trans people saying, oh, it's trendy. It's trendy. Are we supposed to let children change their sex before they're ready? Because what if they change their mind back? And I, it's such a miseducation and an unknowing. Like I had a friend say to me, oh, I know there are eight-year-old kids that are getting transgender surgery without their parents. And I'm like, that's simply not true. No. First of all, there is no eight-year-old that can go to the fucking doctor and, and become— Drive you, themselves there. You can't do that at no. eight. It's just so dumb. But so people, it's, it's insane, that that notion of, like, trendiness, because transness has existed, like, since the beginning of time. And truly, like, in certain cultures, the two spirits or transness was actually, like, seen as almost the most holy or the most reverent or the most respected. Okay. So we're not transing children. There's no inappropriate surgeries being done on young people. And we're definitely not, I guess, chemicalizing uh, a temporary confusion when it comes to gender with our minors. Bullshit. Bullshit. You don't have to go to the most extreme. Oh, we're not doing, you know, double mastectomies on eight-year-olds. That No one's claiming that, but we are doing it on very— mm -hmm. There was a woman who just gave testimony this week in Louisiana who has been on this show, Chloe, who talked about how they took off both of her breasts at age 14. 14. She was only autistic. She wasn't actually gender dysphoric. And now she's mad. So don't—you can make the straw man of the 8-year-old all you want. We are mm -hmm. cutting off the body parts of young children here in our country, uh, and we're not going to play the video now because we don't have enough time, but what do, you, what do you make of it? Well, quite. I mean, I think Dylan Mulvaney just, you know, any time he does an appearance, it's just like, how many times can I take the piss out of what it means to be a woman in 30 minutes? Mm -hmm. For me personally, I was a tomboy growing up. So basically loved football, loved wrestlers, wouldn't wear dresses. And you know what? I'm probably one of the most girly girls you'll ever meet now because I was allowed to be a kid. I was allowed to explore myself without having, you know, things shoved down my throat. And whenever I speak to people about the trans thing, I say, well, all right, what is a woman to you? Because to me personally, a woman isn't a way somebody acts. There's no such thing as acting like a woman. Or there's no such thing as looking like a woman because if a woman wants to wear blue, they're still a woman. So there is no such thing as being able to turn from a man into a woman because unless you think woman being a woman is just a personality or a way you look, which is completely unprogressive and stupid in my eyes, then you can't do that because being a woman mm -hmm. isn't 
you know, being redefined to those things. So unless you think that is what a woman is, then you are yourself a little bit of a bigot, to be quite honest. Um, there's no such thing as being able to change. You know, Kelly people. J. Keen, she's British. She's, that's where I'm getting all my merch that I've been wearing lately, her website. She says a woman is an adult human female. It's very simple and easy mm-hmm. to remember. And she's been fighting over there to just to stop, among other things, the medicalization of these minors. And yeah. there's been a little bit of a breakthrough in the UK just this week where they've decided to stop doing that for minors. They've decided to stop the cross-gender hormones and the puberty blockers and the surgeries. Thank God. It's just like on COVID. You guys saw reason over there before we did. You lost your minds. We lost our minds. You saw reason first. We never really did. And now, you know, we're way behind you in realizing this is child abuse, Leilani. It's absolutely child abuse. And I have to point out that actually just before Easter, unfortunately, we haven't come that far because just before Easter, my friend has a three-year-old daughter and she got an email from the school saying that uh, when they come back after Easter, they cannot wear the little gingham uh, summer dresses because they want the uniform to be more gender neutral. So this is actually going on and they are trying to influence kids at an early age. So I don't care what Dylan Mulvaney, the caricature of a bimbo female tries to say they are trying to influence children and there is social contagion if you look at like how children are around the democratic states it's more them that are becoming you know confused in their gender identity i just saw that gays against groomers posted another article today where they said that there's three huge universities in the usa that are saying that your child could be transgender if they pick up a you know if a little girl picks up a boy's toy or vice versa now i like sophie was also such a tomboy growing up i didn't want to play female sports i actually got my uh, school to start a rugby team for girls when I was 15 years old. <laughs> you know, this went on till I was probably 17 or 18. And I have no doubt that right now, if they saw me the way I was, the way I behaved, the way I dressed, everything, they would try and tell me that I wanted to tr- transition. And if they took Same. that movie, Billy Elliot, with a little boy that wanted to be a ballerina or a ballet dancer, sorry, they would actually say in 2023, I want, you know, Billy Elliot, let's transition him to uh, Sophie, the ballerina. You know, that's yeah, what that's would happen. Right. It wouldn't be Billy being able to be the, the little ballet well, dancer the other boy. Thing. He would they, have to transition. They, the attempt but in that conversation by Dylan to be like, oh, it's it's like so normal, like being no. cis, whatever, being non-cisgendered or being trans or being what it's just so normal. Like it's, I'm sorry, but it's not normal. And if you need only check the internet or TikTok daily for some of these videos to see, there mm-hmm. is an unusually high percentage of very disturbed people claiming that they are in the trans community. And the trans community doesn't kick them out. The trans community doesn't say they don't speak for us. The trans community embraces them as like, yeah, like you go girl. And that brings me to what happened in San Francisco. The San Francisco, um, I think it's the city, but they declined to prosecute uh, somebody who wound up shooting a trans thief. There was a trans thief in a store. I think it was a Walgreens. And it wound up in a confrontation. The security guard wound up shooting the trans thief. Well, the trans community was very angry that they didn't charge the shooter, the security guard, with anything, with doing anything wrong. And this is how, listen, would you look, I warn the listening audience, you might want to like plug your ears and listen to this one, muffle a little. Listen to this lunatic. Imagine that. Ah! I hate this. I hate what you've done to us. I hate what you're doing to us. Perfectly normal. 100% want that person in my restroom and in my locker room. Hard no. It's a hard no. What the hell was that? (laughs) What the hell was that? Sophie, I can't. That's what we're up against. So ladies, fight. That's what we've been saying, right? We finally sort of got it. Fight. Because that's what we're up against. 
I'm sick of this BS. I'll give you the quick last word. Sophie, you, you can take it. Uh, the one thing I hate is when they call us a cis woman. I'm not a cis woman. I'm just a woman. Same, same. Adult human female. You guys, so great to see you. Enjoy tomorrow. And uh, we'll we'll chat after about how it went down and our mutual booing. I, I feel like I'm going to be able to hear you <laughs> across the pond. <laughs> but enjoy the rest of it. All the best. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you all of you for watching and listening this week. We're we're on fire right now. Thanks to you guys. We passed 1 million subscribers on YouTube. We've added like, I don't know, 100,000 this week. It's been crazy. And we remain the number two news commentary podcast in the country and the number five show in podcasts in the country. Thanks to you. Thank you for being here with us and making it happen. We'll pick it up again together on Monday.